chapter 2 this morning. Matthew chapter 2. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 2, and we're going to start by reading verses 1 through 11 this morning as we look at a message we've titled, The Celebrity of Christ's Nativity. So let's read this together. It says in verse 1 of Matthew 2, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art, now, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him, and when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. We're going to stop at the reading right there. We'll read a little more later. But um, like I say, we're going to look this morning at the story behind the first Noel and talk a little bit about Christ's celebrity at his birth. And let's have a word of prayer before we look into this this morning. Lord, we do thank you for what's already gone on before. We thank you for the praise that we can have for this time of the year when we think of your son came, who came as a baby, who came in flesh, that we might worship him. We thank you that we um, have these moments now to study your word. We pray that it might, uh, the truth might reflect and get within us and penetrate us this morning. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work in our midst to convict us, to show us where we we may need to change, where we may need to be more like you. And we just commit this time to you, and we thank you for the opportunity, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been going through a series uh, through the Christmas season, talking about some of the carols of Christmas and the story behind some of them, and trying to tie them back into some of the truths of Scripture that they represent. And uh, this morning is no, no exception. Um, we've titled the message, The Celebrity of Christ's Nativity. And that's because, you know, even though he was born in a manger and he was born to poor parents, uh, there was a certain notoriety that came with his birth as well. And we see that probably expressed the most uh, acutely for us when we see the visit of the wise men who came from the east, who brought him these gifts um, Jesus Christ's celebrity was known far and wide by the scriptures, by the prophecies that had told of his coming. And um, when, we, uh, when we think about this, of what the celebrity of Christ is all about, um, we're just going to look at some simple ideas this morning uh, that come from this song, actually, the first Noel. Now, if you're like me, the first Noel is, I don't know, I shouldn't even say this, probably not one of my favorite Christmas songs. Because it's got, what, 12, 13 verses on it, you know, and they all sound the same. And by the time you're done, you're like, what did, what did we just sing? Well, there's a reason for that. Um, the, the first Noel is actually considered a ballad, and it, and it tells a story over the course of multiple, multiple verses. And the first Noel is actually one of the oldest Christmas ballads that's still sung today. 
Um, it first appeared in print in 1833, so that goes back a good ways as it is. However, the song itself goes back probably at least 300 years before that. So this goes back to the Middle Ages. The exact time and place of its origin are in doubt. Both France and England claim that they're the ones that originated the song, and uh, they can have that debate. But uh, either, either case, they can claim it as part of their heritage. But what we do know is that that word Noel comes from a French word, Noel. It comes from a French word that, that's derived from the word in which we get nativity, or the birth of Christ, and it really means a joyful shout expressing the exhilaration at the birth of Christ. That's what we're talking about when we talk about this first Noel. It's this first exhilarating, jubilant shout, expression of praise, expression of Christ's greatness at his birth. And so the song, we don't know the writer. It was an anonymous writer. However, we do know that enough about the, from the language of the song that, uh, that when they used this word Noel, that they, they understood their language enough to, to use this as an all-encompassing term to begin this chorus every time. Noel, Noel, born is the king of Israel, right? This is the, this is the chorus that ends every one of these long verses. But... Uh, even though he used such a great term and a great expression here to celebrate Christ's birth and to talk of his celebrity, um, we also know that there were quite a few things in the song <laughs> that, uh, that aren't really scripturally sound. In fact, I will tell you this much, um, probably a lot of the, the biggest misinformation that we have about Christmas in our minds as Christians today comes from the understanding of this song, because the writer himself probably didn't actually have a Bible. You think about it, this was the Middle Ages. This was at a time when there were very few Bibles in circulation. They were either, the Bibles that were around were handwritten, it was before the printing press, and they were either written, they were kept in a monastery, or they were kept in the church. And uh, the common people rarely even saw a Bible, let alone read one, and uh, the Bibles were written in Latin at the time, so that wasn't the t typical tongue that they would have even used as a commoner. And even if they would have been able to find a Bible and see it in Latin, uh, they probably wouldn't have read it, been able to read it anyway, because the vast majority of the common people in that time were illiterate. They didn't know how to read or write. And so it's probably the case of the composer of this song, the first Noel. He didn't have a ready Bible to guide him, and so the writer likely just drew stories about what he had been told about the events of Christ's birth. And so he recounted a lot of it accurately, but uh, unfortunately there were some errors. Um, and uh, I don't know whether we don't have to tear the song apart to, to enjoy it, but the fact is we ought to know where the mistakes come into play when we sing the song. So we realize this is a, you know, a song written by a fallible man, right? And, we as men make mistakes. That's part of who we are in humanity. And so uh, this is a song and we see in the first verse, we see on a cold winter's night that was so deep, right? Do we, do we believe that Christ was born on December 25th? I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands. <laughs> but no, uh, it, there's nowhere in the Bible that it says he was born on December 25th. In fact, most scholars would say he probably wasn't born in December at all. Uh, it was more likely he was born in the spring of the year, not in the winter. But even if it was in the winter, in the coldest part of winter, in Bethlehem, do you know what Bethlehem is like? It's not three feet of snow in Bethlehem in the winter. In fact, the, I looked it up. The, the lowest average temperature of the year in Bethlehem is 47 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's colder here today than what the coldest average temperature in Bethlehem is. Now, that doesn't mean they don't see snow. They, they do sometimes. It sometimes gets cold enough to snow there. But, but I don't think there was deep snow, and uh, I don't think this was done in the cold of the winter's night. But uh, anyway, the imagery survives for us, doesn't it? You think of the cold, harsh winter and trudging through the deep snow. We know what that's like in Pennsylvania. I don't think they would have known what that was like in Bethlehem. In Jesus' day. And then, of course, in verse 2, 
It says the shepherds, talks about the shepherds in verse 2. It says they looked up and they saw a star shining in the east. Well, do we correct ourselves there? The Bible doesn't say anything about the shepherds seeing a star. What did the shepherds see? Do we know? They saw the angels. That's right. The angels gave them a lot more information than the star would have ever given the wise men. But the angels, they were there to tell them directly, here's what it is, and here's where you're going, and here's what we can praise. So that's what, uh, that's what they needed to head into to worship, worship Jesus as a baby when he was born in Bethlehem. But they didn't look up and see a star in the east. Um, the angels appeared to them. And then, of course, um, it says in verse 3, talking about the wise men then, that the star went right over the place where Jesus lay as if he was still there in the cradle. And, you know, I love this. We don't, how many of you have your nativity scenes out and you have your three wise men, right? And they're sitting there with their gifts right at the old feed trough of the stable, right? Giving, giving the baby Jesus his, his, uh, his frankincense and gold and myrrh. And, uh, and that is, uh, unfortunately, not what the Bible says about, uh, about the wise men. No, the, the says that we just read this morning, they, they found the young child, and they found him in a house. And, uh, and so we know that, uh, that he wasn't, uh, uh, they, they, the star didn't bring them to, to Bethlehem over that stable that night. And it took them probably many months, if, if not even longer than that, to actually make the trek to, uh, to, the, to the, the Holy Land and meet with Herod and do all of these things. It didn't all happen in one night. Uh, so it, uh, it, uh, there's, there's some inaccuracies. So let's just... We could still enjoy the song. I hope I didn't ruin it for you. We could still enjoy it. We can still recognize, however, that Scripture always trumps what's written down in our, in our verses that we sing at the Christmas season. And, uh, and just, by the way, this is a side note. The song doesn't say this. How many wise men were there? We don't know. <laughs> we, don't, we always say there's always three wise men in your nativity, right? And if you lose one, you're like, oh, no, I need three, right? No, you, you have three wise men. That's not, that's not what the Bible says. There were three gifts that they gave, right? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And magi just means more than one. Have you ever thought of this? There might have only been two wise men. Or there might have been ten wise men. We don't know. I mean, we don't know how many there were. We just know there was more than one and that they brought three gifts. So here's... Uh, Again, that's not in the song, but nonetheless, that's for free this morning. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of inaccuracies that we have about Christmas. And that brings us to the first point that I just want to share this morning. That when we think about who Jesus is and the celebrity that he brings, the fact that he is so great, it's often easy for us to get the message wrong. To get it, you know, to have put error along with the truth to not really give the whole picture or even know the whole picture. That's why the Bible says to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to understand the scripture first. We shouldn't be informed from our theology based on our hymn book. Uh, our theology should be informed from scripture. And we always need to be studying and looking to that, uh, to that truth that's unchangeable, that's written down for us. And so then we are able to properly convey, and that's our first point this morning, that his celebrity was conveyed. We need to convey the truth of Jesus Christ, and we need to convey it accurately. Um, when we think of this idea, even the word Noel, the whole song is about conveying the news and the jubilant praise of Christ's birth. It's, it's, that's all wrapped up into this word. Um, it can be traced to the, the word that, that means... Um, an announcement or a declaration is a Noel, um, and it's used in different different fashions in that way in different uh, different contexts. So, how was this announcement, this declaration made at the time of his birth? Well, we see this in a couple of different uh, different contexts. We didn't read it this morning, but first of all, when Christ was born, we already talked about the fact that the shepherds were conveyed the message by the angels. Right? The angels brought that message to the shepherds. And they gave him, they gave those shepherds exactly what they needed to know. They, uh, in this day, in the, in, the, in the city of David, is a Savior born, is Christ the, Christ the Lord, and you need to go and you need to, to worship him. And they went and they did that, right? They were conveyed the message, and then they responded to that message from the angels. We also see another way in which his 
celebrity was conveyed at the time of his birth. And that was, of course, by the star. And I think this is interesting. We see in verse um, 1 and 2 of what we just read in Matthew chapter 2, it says, When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Now, the scripture doesn't tell us exactly where in the east, but it's not, you know, the east end of town. We do know that. I mean, this was a far country in the east. This was a place located far away. These people were not Jewish believers. These were astronomers, wise men, scribes, noblemen, people who, who knew the scriptures, who had scripture apparently with them. They knew these prophecies, but they came from a different background, a different persuasion, and somehow they recognized in a star, because a lot of these these wise men back in the day studied the stars. They studied astronomy, and they, they put a lot of weight into that. And so what do they say when they come to Herod the king in verse 2? They say, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. So I don't know how God did this in their minds. I don't know how God put it all together for them. And I, don't, and I really don't believe it was just their intellect and academic standing. I think some way God implanted in them this truth that, hey, something special is here. Look up, see this star, read this prophecy. And they, they were able to put this all together to the point that they were recognizing that something big was happening in Bethlehem. And so they, God used a star, a single star, to convey the celebrity of Christ's birth. And he put it together in the mind of a foreigner. People that weren't even local to that land. People who weren't the Pharisees. They weren't the scribes. They weren't the people who were to be educated. In fact, the Pharisees and the scribes, they missed the star, didn't they? <laughs> it took guys from a foreign land in the east to look up and recognize this is something special. I see the prophecies of the Bible coming true in, uh, in the birth of Christ and through this star. And so... For, it, it, I think it's very ironic then that they come, they come to Bethlehem and they meet with the ruling power of the day, the great King Herod. He was the one who had rebuilt the temple. He had done many, many works in Jerusalem. And, uh, and here he was, the king of the Jews. He was the ruler of the Jews. And they came to him and they said in verse, uh, in verse 3, when Herod had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. So Herod got told of Jesus Christ's celebrity by some strangers from a foreign land. Do you see the irony in that? <laughs> Here were these foreigners that came, and they were noble, and they were rich, and they were powerful in, in some stature that they have. But here they are coming to the land where the ruling king should have known what was going on in his own kingdom. And they figured, well, we'll just go to the top guy. He'll know, he'll know what's going on here. And they said, well, what do you mean? I <laughs> uh, didn't, didn't, didn't know about this. And they, why, he didn't have an answer for the wise men, did he? And in fact, he was troubled because he didn't have the answers. Because it took somebody from the outside to come in and tell him about the celebrity of Jesus Christ. And it says not only was he troubled, that he troubled those in Jerusalem around him. Can you imagine? Can you imagine Herod coming to you as one of the religious leaders of the day and saying, hey, I just had three guys knock at my door, or 12, or whatever they were, <laughs> and they just told me that some king of the Jews was born according to our own prophecies? Why weren't you guys on top of this? <laughs> yeah, can you imagine? This guy, I'm sure he was livid. And he went to these scribes and these Pharisees. All of Jerusalem, it says, was troubled at the news that these wise men came. And they had caught on to some news about Jesus Christ and his celebrity that they didn't catch on their own. So what did the priests and the scribes do? They, they get conveyed Jesus' message too. They say, oh, well, let's look that up. We'll look that up for you, Herod. Let's see what he has to say. Oh, that's right. Let's look at verses 4 to 6. He says, He gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together. He demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, Oh, 
we looked this one up. Here's what it is. It's in Bethlehem of Judea. It was written down for us all this time. I don't know how we missed that before, you know. <laughs> Can you imagine the egg on their face? Here they are. Oh, that's right. Herod, uh, sorry, we should have warned you last week. But, uh, yeah, this is, this is what they're talking about here. And in verse, uh, verse 6, they actually quote from the prophet, Thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah, art thou not the least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall a governor, shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Boy, the news gets a little worse. Uh, by the way, Herod, you know that baby that the prophecies are talking about, that these wise men are asking about? Uh, he's going to be governor. Uh, he, he's going to be a ruler. He, he's going to be a king. Um, sorry about that bad news, Herod. Uh, <laughs> this has to have been a very awkward situation for the priests and the scribes. But yet, it was there in black and white before them, but they had missed it. Now, isn't that true for us today? God's truth, who Christ is and what he means and what the significance of what he does for us and means for us today, we all get that sometimes in different methods, in different ways, don't we? If I went around the room this morning and asked, how did you first learn about Christ? There's probably a story that's unique to every individual. The question is, what do we do when we learn about that Christ? How do we respond? What do we do to, to either accept or reject this message? Do we, do we sit around and say, well, yeah, I've heard about Christ. I grew up in Sunday school all my life. We've been hearing those Bible stories and all this time. And, you know, yep, that's what it is. I'm, I, I'm there. Well, this was where the priests were, right? They had heard all these things, but they missed the significance of it. They missed the, the, the weight of the fact that here was the prophesied Messiah being born about eight miles away from where they were there in Jerusalem, and they had missed it. The prophets for thousands of years had put together these, these, these details so that they wouldn't miss it, so that they would get it. And you know what? Even though they knew all the facts and all the figures and all the details and all the prophecies, when the day came, they missed it. Some of us get conveyed the truth of Jesus Christ. We know all the facts. We know all the details. And you know what? We still miss it. I've heard it said one time, you know, sometimes the, 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 the difference between heaven and hell for us is about 18 inches. You know, we have it all in our head. We know all the knowledge. We have all the facts. But it never affects our heart. We never accept him. We never trust him by faith. Jesus Christ says, you need to come to me by faith. And you will get my grace. My grace will come in. Your whole, my Holy Spirit will come into you. You will be born again. And you know, it's not just about knowing all the facts. It's not about being able to recite the Bible stories. It's not about being able to enjoy the Christmas story. Those are all good things. But we need to have Christ in our heart. We need to have accepted his finished work on the cross. We need to recognize I'm a sinner. And without Christ, I don't have any hope. His celebrity is important to us. We need to have that on the inside in a personal way when we get conveyed that message. And then for those of us that do know Christ, that message has been conveyed, it's been delivered, and it's affected our lives from the inside. What's our responsibility? To do those same things that the wise men went and did, right? To go and convey that message accurately to people around us. You know, today, God's not going to put a star in, in a, up above people to, to, to point people to Christ. God doesn't take angels in the sky and, and show them to people and say, this is how you're going to get to know my son, Jesus Christ. He's not going to send, you know, um, Herod to you. <laughs> I'd be glad about that. <laughs> the king's not going to come and say, hey, you need to know Christ. You need, what's this all about? no. What does the Bible say? How do we convey that message today? Through the foolishness of preaching. 1 Corinthians 1.20 says this. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. This points right back to this point in time. 
the world that should have known through their wisdom and through their prophecies, they should have known God, they should have seen him, they should have captured the essence of what was going on here at his birth. He says, the world by wisdom knew not God, so what happened? It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Here's why. He says, for the Jews require a sign. Again, this is still from 1 Corinthians 1. The Jews require a sign. They got the sign, but they missed it. <laughs> he says, the Greeks seek after wisdom. They want some logical argument that makes them understand Christ. Sometimes they get, we get stuck up on our logic, right? We don't understand simple faith defies logic. Simple faith is about trusting Christ alone. He says, well, what do we do? The foolishness of preaching, here's what it's all about. We preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. What is Paul saying? We're preaching the celebrity of Jesus Christ. We're talking about making him known to the world around us and making the, the simple facts known that he, he was crucified. He died for our sins, and he broke the bonds of death. He was resurrected so that we can walk in newness of life. He wants us to know that simple message, that simple fact. And we can talk a lot about Jesus Christ, but when we talk about him and we begin to be those preachers, we begin to be the ones that convey that word. We need to be sure that we are conveying it accurately, that we are preaching faithfully, and that we are doing what even Paul said, recognizing that Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Well, let's get back to our story. So we see that his celebrity was conveyed, and it needs to be conveyed, and it needs to be conveyed today. But let's get back to the, uh, the rest of the story about the first Noel. Again, written in the Middle Ages, and it's one of the few surviving Christmas standards that can genuinely be earmarked as a folk song. We talked about it being a ballad. It's, a, it's an old Middle Age folk song. And uh, whoever was responsible for writing this carol was obviously incredibly enthusiastic about Christmas. You hear this over and over again in the carol. Um, in England, the first Noel was sung each year by many peasants as they lit the Yule log. The Yule log was an old tradition that was passed down through other, other means, but they used to do this as part of their Christmas tradition. And that was uh, the first Noel became the song that started the entire Christmas season for them when they lit the Yule log. And though its words and music were not even written down at the time in the Middle Ages, this song was passed from one family to the next, from one generation to the next. And over time, this was just a song that the common person would have sung at Christmas time. And for th the first 300 years of its existence, this song, like all other carols, it was not a part of religious services. You didn't go to church and sing the first Noel. No, that's something you sang at home. The church had its own music, and they didn't think the song like this was fit to be used in church. The first Noel, um, if it was, because it was a new song, just like a lot of other new songs, and even if they embraced a story from the scriptures, these new songs that were being written, they were not allowed in the church services. The clergy at the time, they disdained carols like the first Noel, and they became, therefore, the holiday voice of the people. This became the song that the people cared about. The people passed down from one generation to another, the family tradition. And we can't get into all of them, but there's a lot of songs, Christmas songs, especially in our hymn books, that would have been lost if the common folks had not passed them down from one generation to another. Uh, because they weren't celebrated in the church. In fact, they were condemned. They were condemned as saying this is not appropriate for use in the church. And uh, so I just want to stop right there and recognize something else that's true about our story that we talk about with Christ. And that is, just like this song was condemned for the first 300 years, 
not to be a part of church or worship or anything else, oftentimes when we hear of the truth of Christ, that message is condemned in us too, isn't it? It's condemned by people that we meet. Let's read again our story from Matthew chapter 2. Let's pick it up in verse 12. We're going to take, take a look at what happened. What was the result of this story? We see, um, we see, first of all, we just talked about the fact that for the priests and the scribes, they were condemned for not knowing, right? They were condemned for not recognizing the truth that was here. But what do we see in verse 12? It says here was the, 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 the Magi again. Verse 12 says, They being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem. And in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. There was a lot of condemnation that came as a result of Christ's birth. We don't often think about this horrific part of the Christmas story. But you know, the birth of Jesus Christ there in that manger in Bethlehem was great for us, it was great for his parents, it was great for the salvation of the world, but it wasn't so great for all of the mothers that gave birth in that town and in that villages surrounding Bethlehem in the days before and after the birth of Christ. Think about what they had to sacrifice because of the condemnation that Herod brought down upon this, this, this region of the land, all because a king was born, all because of the birth of Jesus Christ. There was condemnation that came with it. You know, we think about the word celebrity. I chose this on purpose because what does celebrity mean? In our minds today, celebrity often talks about, you know, who's, uh, who's making, the, making the moves, right? Who's always on, on the Twitter or who's always on the Facebook or who's always making the news about whatever. I don't even understand why some people are celebrities anymore. But, uh, but nonetheless, they put their face in the magazine and they get celebrated, right? They're celebrity. They are well-known. They're people that become household names. And I can name you household names that I'm not going to. You, can, you know, you know the name. When I say the word Trump, he didn't have to become president. He was a celebrity before he was a president, right? Trump became synonymous with whatever it is that he represented before, before he even became president. You think of a name that's in current day thought, you, 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 just a single name, and you know. You know what that represents. You know who they are. But you know, people's celebrity come and it goes. If I said to you the name um, Mr. Atlas, anybody know Mr. Atlas? Only a few of the older generation. Mr. Atlas was a celebrity in the 50s, <laughs> but he's not so much anymore today. He was known as a strong man. He was known as a, you know, a, a celebrity in, in that day. Uh, you, you, he was synonymous with strength and vitality. Today, we don't know who he is. That's why people's celebrity comes and goes. Who can name me a celebrity from 1820? Hmm, okay. <laughs> Not sure about that one. How about 1750? Well, maybe George Washington. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, Abraham Lincoln maybe came. He became a celebrity. We still maybe have a few of them. But for the most part, celebrities that lived and died and moved on, we don't know anymore. And the same will happen for us today. But you know, the celebrity, the well-known nature of who Jesus Christ, that has lived on. From the time of his birth, 2,000 years ago until today, 
there is hardly an individual that doesn't know the name Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean that they know him, but I get I can guarantee you that you've met lots of people that know every four-letter word in the, in the alphabet, and Jesus is the only six, five-letter word that they know, right? <laughs> because they use it. They know his name. People know the name of Jesus Christ, but they don't know him. Just like sometimes we have celebrities that we talk about, we see their pictures and we know what this is or we know what it's about, but we don't really know them. You know, the difference in Christ's celebrity is he wants us to know him. He wants us to know him personally. And you know, people can take what they hear of Christ and they can decide if it's for me or if it's not for me. He doesn't force us to choose him. Just because he's well-known doesn't mean he's always well-liked. And this is the case here with uh, the King Herod. The, pri the priest and the scribe, I think there's two reasons. There's probably more, but there's two reasons in our story this morning for why Jesus Christ's celebrity sometimes gets condemned, why it sometimes gets disliked by people. And I think the two reasons are this. You look at the story of the priests and the scribes, the ones who were the religious leaders of the day. These were the ones who were controlling the worship. They were controlling the people with the, the, the religion that they had established and the, the sets of rules that they had built up around the law. What was Jesus Christ to them? He was a threat. He was a threat to their leadership. He was a threat to their way of doing things. If they understood the prophecies correctly, all of the stuff that they had been doing was going to go by the wayside. The Messiah was going to fulfill these things. He was going to set up his own throne in the temple. He was going to ultimately change everything that they knew that allowed them to control and, 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 and keep power. The priests and the scribes, the Pharisees, this, he, he was a threat to their leadership. How many times does Christ threaten to take over the leadership in our own lives? You know, that's what he wants. When we accept Christ as our Savior, what does he want? You ever hear the, the term, God is, you know, Jesus is my co-pilot? You got it wrong. <laughs> he doesn't want to be your co-pilot. <laughs> he wants to be the pilot. He wants the leadership. He wants control of every aspect of your life. He wants to, to fly you in the direction that he wants to take you. He doesn't get second seat. And I think the Pharisees and the scribes knew some of this. And they didn't want to play second fiddle to Jesus. He was a threat to their leadership. And for King Herod, of course, he was deceptive with the wise men. He says, oh, let me know when you go find him because I'm going to come and worship him also. And uh, that was the most thinly veiled, insincere statement of malice that I think you've ever heard. And this was emitted from the words of King Herod, only to ultimately come back to, um, uh, you know, the, the, the great massacre that he enacted there in the, in the city to try to kill off every person. Why was he so against Jesus Christ? Because he was a threat to Herod's lordship. It was a threat to Herod's lordship. Do you hear what the, I don't think you realize the significance of this. In Birkin verse 2 of Matthew 2, the wise men came to him and the first thing we hear them say was, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Why is this significant? We don't even think, okay, so they just said this. Do you realize that in 40 BC, King Herod, who was friends, by the way, with Mark Antony, remember if you're your old Roman history, we had Mark Antony and Cleopatra and the stories there. King Herod was personal friends with Mark Antony. And so he knew a lot of the Roman Senate. He had a lot of the inroads to the political higher-ups in Rome. He had worked and worked, not just politically, but through a lot of nefarious means, <laughs> to get himself to the place where by 40 B.C., this was almost 35 years or more before Christ was born, the Roman Senate in Rome sat together and they voted to have King Herod named the title King of the Jews. That was King Herod's official title, according to the Roman Senate. The Roman Senate 
called him the king of the Jews. They gave him a garrison of Roman, Roman soldiers. And he went and for the next three years did battle with the different ruling families in Jerusalem and, and in the region at the time. And by the time 37 B.C. came along, Herod was not only the king of the Jews in title, he was officially conquered the land. He had officially taken control of it. And he was still a puppet under the Roman government, but he was named the king of the Jews. But you know what? He wasn't born. He was a self-made man. He was made the king of the Jews. He was declared the king of the Jews, but he wasn't born the king of the Jews. So when the, the wise men came and says, I just he just spent thirty, he spent three years fighting and thirty-five years ruling and establishing himself as the king of the Jews. The wise men came knocking at the door, some stranger, and says, Hey, who is this? Who's the guy that's born king of the Jews? What? Can you imagine Herod's reaction? What? Born king of the Jews? Yes, he was born. He was a threat to Herod's lordship. And, uh, and for that, he was condemned. Jesus Christ wants to be Lord of our lives. We can't allow the things that we fought for, the things that we live for, the things that we want to make all about us become more important than what Christ wants to be above us. He wants to be Lord of our life. And we have to not have the same reaction that Herod did when we come to that. My time's about up, but we're going to just get through this quickly. The last part of this story. We see that Jesus Christ's celebrity was conveyed. We see that it was condemned. Let's look at this third part of the story. It was, wasn't until 1833 when a fellow by the name of William Sandys finally published the song, The First Noel. He was a lawyer by trade. But he loved music, and he spent his spare time collecting both French and English folk songs. How do you like that for a hobby? <laughs> anyway, this was his hobby. Already, if this song was a favorite by the peasant class, and by the mid-1800s, um, after this song was published, eventually the church did begin to use some of these new songs during their services. And so it was that this song, the first Noel, already established in people's homes, found universal acclaim within the church. This song, even though it was written by a common, illiterate man, it remains a very loved carol. The writer seemed to bring this jubilant spirit to the song, a song that no doubt the composer not only believed every word that he wrote, but he was excited about the story that he had to share. It represents one element that eludes so many of us and so many of our world during the Christmas season, and that is the announcement of Christ's arrival on earth. It's easy to see around us lots of decorations, the holly, the trees, the Christmas spirit, the well-wishing, the this and the that, and to miss what is most important, and that is the fact that Christ's birth requires us to announce it, to it to the world around us. It says in verse, the last verse of the song about these wise men, then entered in those wise men three, full reverently upon their knee, they offered there in his presence their gold and myrrh and frankincense. You know, even though they were from a foreign land, and even though they, they, they had limited information by which to find Christ, when they found him, you know what they were? They were committed to him. They were fully committed. Do you realize what these wise men had to go through? They had to travel at their own expense across foreign lands. I mean, there was no interstate at the time. They didn't take, you know, the jet plane. No, they, they went on foot or they went with camels or they, they, they went the hard way from a foreign land. They, they made that commitment in time to seek him out. They spent much research. It took a lot of research even beforehand to even recognize this Christ by studying the prophecies, by recognizing they had invested a lot of time to find him. They committed their financial resources to him. Frankincense, gold, and myrrh, they, you know, they don't just you know, pop up out of nowhere. These, these men were men of means, yes, but this was a significant gift. In fact, a lot of scholars say, you know, how did Mary and Joseph afford to go on an extended hiatus to Egypt when they had to flee? 
A lot of scholars say it was probably the money that they got from this gold and myrrh and frankincense that allowed them to even survive in Egypt for all this time. If you go off and live in a hotel for a few months or a couple of years, you know that the bills start racking up. Well, this was a means by which God provided for them, I think. But it was because these wise men decided to commit their financial resources to, uh, to, this, uh, to this truth of Christ. They had come prepared to give this to him. And ultimately, they were committed to God's leading in their life. When God, through the angel, came and showed them this is not what it seems with Herod, they, they okay, we'll change plans, God. <laughs> we'll go a different way home. We'll go the hard route. <laughs> we'll go the long way. Uh, we'll go the scenic route, whatever. You know, they, they, they were willing to change plans, even though it wasn't convenient for them, for the sake of God's will, for the sake of God's leading. And I can't bring you all of that application, but I think you see where it where it goes. Where are we with Christ and our commitment to him? Where is our commitment? Where does it lead us? Do we spend the time of research like the wise men did to really know who Christ is and know the truth? Do we, do we really prepare and commit our financial resources to him? Because did the wise men know that this gift was needed for those, those people to be able to survive? No, they didn't. They did this in faith. They felt led to give of their financial resources, and God knew that they were needed to be given. And that's how he used it abundantly. How often does God meet needs in the lives of other people because of our commitment to dedicate financial resources to them? I can stand here and tell you stories for the next hour of how that's happened in my life. God uses this within the family of faith. And then they, they were committed to God's leading. How often are we so intent <laughs> on doing it our way, on the plans that we think we've made, the plans that we have in our life, that when God comes and says, hey, we need to nudge just a little bit, we need to make a little tweak, we need to go home a different way, it's going to be not convenient for you, are we willing to make those changes? When we're truly committed to who Christ is and what he's done, and who God is in our life, I think we recognize our response needs to be one of commitment. So we have the need to convey Christ's celebrity, the recognition that some will condemn the celebrity of Christ, and ultimately we should have a response where we have a full commitment to who Christ is, to knowing him, and to making him known. Let's have a word of prayer. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm not going to prolong things, but I just want to ask you a question as you settle your heart before the Lord. No one's looking around, but I just wonder if maybe there's someone here this morning. Maybe it's you. God's been working in your heart through this, and maybe you've recognized for the first time this morning that hey, I, I know about Christ. I, I know a lot of the stories but I don't really know that I have a personal relationship with him. You know, knowing Christ and knowing about him and celebrating the Christmas season, it's not going to mean much if you don't know him in a personal way. If that's you this morning, I'd just like to pray for you. There won't be any, any special call this morning, but just raise your hand. I'd like to pray for you. Say, I'd like to know Christ as my Savior. I know about him, but I don't really know him in my heart. I haven't put my faith in him, my trust in him. Is that you this morning? Would you raise your hand? Maybe there's someone else this morning. We say, hey, I, I've known Christ all my life. I've trusted in him. I'm born again. But, you know, I don't know that I'd have the commitment of those wise men. I'm not sure that maybe I've been conveying Christ's truth accurately or faithfully to others. And God's just stirred me in some way and shown me something specific this morning that that I need to commit to him. Is that you this morning? I'd just like to pray with you. No one's looking around. Just raise your hand. Yes. Others. I'd like to find a greater commitment to Christ. God's showing me that. Others? Lord, we thank you 
that Jesus Christ came, that he is well known, but yet we still have a message to bring. We pray for those that raised their hands this morning, that you're working in hearts. I pray that you would continue to work in those hearts. Help us to find greater commitment. Help us to be more faithful in conveying your truth to others and showing people who Christ is and what he's done for them. We just ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen.